Hey guys, welcome to Question of Strength. This is Barney the Dinosaur, your host. Now, this is Coach Christian Thibodeau, and I'm here to both uh, talk about training, my own training, or something I've learned or experimented with uh, to help your training. I'm also here to answer your questions, whatever they may be. Questions related to training, supplementation, nutrition are all welcome. Of course, you can post them in the chat menu uh, on the right of your screen, and I'm going to answer them uh, as all right. Uh, now, I want to start with uh, describing what I did this morning because it might actually be of interest to you, especially if I explain, and I will, uh, why I'm taking those options. Now, today was one of my um, conditioning days. Uh, just for recapping purposes, I have two types of lifting workouts right, right, right now. The first one is a strength workout. I'm using basically three or four main strength lifts. These are the hypo from blocks. As your pipe from blocks, uh, the weighted dips, the zercher squat, and the barbell curl. These are my primary lifts, those that I want to be strongest at at the moment. And I'm using uh, 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 the Doug Edburn progression model. Basically, um, I have, by the way, I have two types of workout the, the, the pump workout, which is not really pump, but that's how Edburn called it, and a strength workout or the new old workout. The new old workout is centered around sets of four to three reps. I do eight work sets per exercise. By the way, I do them as a strength. And, and the way I'm progressing is that I'm gradually filling up the sets, meaning that I might start with two sets of three reps and six sets of two reps. The next workout, I'm going to be doing four sets of three and four sets of two. Then I'm going to be doing six sets of three, two sets of two. And when I'm at eight sets of three, the next workout, I can add weight. And that's uh, a form of double progression. It's literally like this lowest progression you can have but for what i want to accomplish right now because i'm not 100 percent devoted on strength and i want to keep my joints healthier for boxing and martial arts uh, this is the right uh, training approach for me uh, and i also do a, a, a more of a pump workout which is kind of similar but using higher reps so instead of doing sets of uh, two to three i'm doing sets of four or five and again it's five sets i start with two sets of five then at two sets of four and i'm just filling the set until I am at five by five, by which time I will have the weight. Okay, I'm using the same exercises that way. And after that, I typically will add uh, one or two other exercises. They can be uh, a hypertrophy movement for a muscle I want to emphasize, or it could be conditioning exercise, depending on what I feel like doing. Uh, I also have a, a dynamic warm up, which is which lasts four minutes. And it's non stop activity. I use the inertial wave, which is basically just big band you just you can do like a lot of rope stuff with it and i do uh boxing or grab and grabbing specific drills 30 seconds per drill as fast as i can uh, and i do four different drills and i repeat the whole thing uh twice for a total duration of four minutes and that actually get my heart going so it, it, it for shoulder mobility shoulder health my, my shoulder i've never felt as good as there right now for at least 10 years so that's a positive now, my other type of workout is uh, the conditioning workout. Conditioning workout to the external view or external eye could actually look somewhat like a CrossFit one, uh, like a mid-duration CrossFit one. I sh I'm shooting typically for 25 to 30 minutes of work. Uh, and I, the main difference with CrossFit workout is that I don't include a lot of high-skill exercise. Uh, like I don't like to use movements that require a certain level of skill while you're in a fatigue state. I believe that this is something that will cause more injury and do more harm than good. I'm also keeping uh, the rep ranges or the distances I'm covering sane. In that I'm not trying to see uh, how much work I can withstand. It, 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 it's still built with a progressive uh, improvement uh, in mind. Uh, so typically I'm doing a circuit of four to six exercises. Typically, my, my average is five, okay? Uh, and I, I don't rest between the stations. I will rest for about a minute, a minute and a half between circuits. Oftentimes, it's actually spent on, on the station you're buying, just slowly rolling uh, during two minutes or a minute and a half for my rest period, or I just rest completely for one minute to nine seconds. And like, I'm gonna use, in the, and also the main difference with CrossFit is that each exercise I'm selecting, even though it looks more just like a way to burn calories or get your heart rate going, it actually has a secondary purpose. Uh, for example, right now, as I probably mentioned in the past, 
uh, I, I'm doing a lot of fighting training. I'm doing boxing, I'm doing uh, martial arts, and I'm going to start uh, grappling. Uh, so my training is geared toward that. Not 100%, but it's slowly moving toward that. I'm going to give an example of what I did this morning. This morning, the circuit was the first movement was this. Body weight dips only. Why dips? Because it's one of, for me, it's at the moment, oddly enough, I know that a lot of people say that dips are hard on the shoulders. For some reason, dips is the one pressing exercise where I have zero shoulder pain. So it's the only pressing movement I can do both frequently and with the wood properly. So, so I'm really focusing on improving my dips. And I like to do them for reps with body weight only during my conditioning circuit to do for something like 20 ish reps per round. Uh, then I moved to my, my second exercise, which was, uh, the kettlebell. Um, I don't know if there's a name for it, but let's say the, the hook training, like a, like a hook in boxing, you're basically grabbing the double with both hands, you're taking a boxing stand and you just throw it in as fast as possible as if you're trying to throw, uh, the hardest hook you can. Now, what I like about that technique is that it trains both rotational power, but also the capacity absorb force because the more power you produce the more you have to stop at the end so that creates that strength and that deceleration that is under trained in many athletes and probably uh, the main cause for injury when you're very good at accelerating but not much good at decelerating the chance of injury is much higher uh, so i'm doing that drill or typically uh sets of 20 reps per side going as fast as possible and then right after that i do uh that i did the kettlebell uh, hype, uh, long pole. Uh, a long pole is kind of a hybrid between a snatch grip high pole or a, a high pole and uh, uh, American kettlebell swing. We actually hand up with a kettlebell overhead. So what you do is essentially you do a high pole with a kettlebell, but instead of stopping here, you continue until it's overhead. That I find it's actually a very good way to get those traps and shoulders firing. I also like, I think it transfers somewhat to punching power. And I use it both for uh, conditioning, but also because I love jacks. Traps. And I found that exercise to be one of the best yoke builders. I'm using that for that purpose. I, I did uh, sets of 10 reps with that. Uh, then I moved on to a dual carry, meaning that I have two loaded carries in a row. If you've been reading my work, you know how much I love all the carries. I believe that they can be adjusted to pretty much any training goal for strength, for size, even for speed, uh, for conditioning, for fat loss. It's a very good tool. It's great for core strength and to get those muscles that you would normally not get with more traditional training. So I did two different loaded carries in a row. So the first one uh, was the heavy bag carry. So I took a, a heavy boxing bag. I think it was 160. And I grab it as, as a bear hug, I lift it, and I walk it for, um, uh, it was 20 meters twice or 40 meters. Um, the next carry was um, the farmer's walk. So my, that's my traditional one. Again, because I just love big traps, and I find uh, uh, the farmer's walk to be a great traps builder, as well as uh, even a, a medial deltoid builder, because the shoulder is actually involved in stabilizing the shoulder while walking with a load. Um, bonus to actually work on stabilization, the core, and all that stuff. We've also done for 40 meters. So that was my circuit. And I rested for, it's enough to go to the water fountain and go back to dips. If anything, the dips for me, and, and I'm proud to say this, because I used, when I started this training phase, my conditioning was horrendous. I mean, I thought that because I was doing lots of steady state cardio, I would be decent at harder conditioning. And it was just not the case. I got like, winded like literally i felt like i was about to die after like half a round but now the dips actually feel like i'm resting because i'm recovering much faster it's still like i still get winded but i can basically bring my heart rate down and bring my my breathing down and feel normal within like 30, 30 seconds which did not happen to me in the past i'm really happy, happy about that so that was my workout today the exercises are not always the same, but they always have a very specific purpose. Okay? That's why the main difference between my conditioning workouts and CrossFit-ish was. All right. Uh, so that having been said, one thing I want to address, I talked about this in previous question of strength, uh, that a, a calorie deficit is not a caloric deficit. Mainly that not all caloric deficits are the same. 
Specifically, you can a caloric deficit is essentially just a, the difference between your intake and your output. Okay, uh, so you can create a deficit either by reducing your intake so that it's lower than your output, or you can increase your output so that becomes higher than your intake, or you can have a combination of both. Okay, uh, and what I mentioned in the past is that if the caloric deficit is done with a higher food consumption, meaning that you don't reduce calories as much, you still do, but not as much, but you increase output a lot more. So more of the caloric deficit material comes from an increased level of activity rather than eating less, okay? Basically, the more food you can keep in while staying being in a deficit, the better it is. Meaning that you, during the course of that fat loss process, you actually feel much better. You have more energy. You don't have uh, as many cravings. You don't have, uh, you're not ravenous. Your sleep is not as affected or not affected at all. Uh, you don't have that lethargy that often comes with excessive dieting. And more importantly, you don't have all the metabolic adaptations that comes with excessive restriction in food. Those metabolic Adaptations are reduction in metabolic rate. Essentially, you have several mechanisms. Might, one might be thyroid, one might be through the leptin and ghrelin system. You basically are uh, burning less calories. Your metabolic baseline metabolic rate decreases. So it's essentially uh, reducing how much calories you are burning, even if you don't change anything else. And obviously, that makes it a lot harder to improve the fat. It also makes it a lot easier to regain the fat once you get back to a regular eating uh, schedule or, or quantity, okay? Uh, so the more food you can keep in, I believe that all the negative things you see with a fat loss phase, okay? The hunger pain, the craving, uh, the lack of sleep, the stress, the anxiety, the feeling lazy, the feeling like crap, the drop in libido, all of that is mostly coming from an excessive reduction in food intake. You don't have enough nutrients coming in, okay? And so my, what I said is that if you can eat as much food as, you, as possible, but you do that by increasing physical activity, then the dieting process is, I wouldn't say a breeze, because you still have to do the work and you still have to eat properly, but you feel a lot better, you have more energy, and basically you stay normal, you stay normal. And I've noticed that myself right now, I'm darn near photo shoot shape. Although this week, for some reason, I'm holding more water uh, and I'm having uh, gastrointestinal issues. Might be my, my, my gut microbiome, might be a change of season, I don't know. But a uh, bit more water, but from the leanest perspective, like my skin is really, is, is really tight. So uh, And I feel like I'm not even dieting. I don't have those days where I feel like that. Normally, when I'm in that state, I'm on the couch. 10 hours a day. I, I don't do anything. I just, I don't have the energy or the drive to be functional. Now, of course, people would want to have studies to, to back up what I'm claiming because, well, that's just my experience. Although I've seen it with many clients uh, and my wife also. Uh, so, one study I just recently uh, read, um, I'm going to try to post the link in the comments section, um, is uh, compared. Exactly what I'm saying. What, what I mentioned: either creating a, a 25% deficit by caloric restriction, so reducing food intake or caloric intake by 25%, or to a mix of activity and a smaller food reduction. In the study, they use a 12.5% reduction in caloric intake and a 12.5% increase in output for the same 25%. Uh, what the study found was that. Amount, and by the way, the study lasted six months, uh, so they measured everything at three and six months. Uh, what they found was the amount of weight loss was the same in both groups, okay? uh, which is interesting because, well, we could argue that the group that did exercise might have lost a bit more fat because by doing training, we might have retained more lean muscle mass. Uh, and if it was only cardio, then it still allows you to protect like half of the muscle mass you would use through a diet only approach. If it was weightlifting, it protects a lot more than that. But still, meaning that you probably lost a bit more fat in the calories, small calorie restriction plus physical activity, 
but more importantly, it was at least even. Okay, so that, that tells me that it, it, it doesn't matter even if you were having a less of a food reduction by increasing activity, they got the same results or even better results. But more interestingly, they measured uh, the drop in metabolic rate and also the change in behavior leading to a decrease in general physical activity, just moving around during the day. Okay? What they found was that when you have a, a larger calorie restriction, the 25% reduction, it was a significant decrease in metabolic rate and also a change in behavior that led to a lower overall activity level. So much so that that led to a decrease on average of between 450 to 600 calories less per day. That's significant. And when they measured the same thing for the group who did a smaller reduction in calories and a higher amount of activity, they found no change in metabolic rate, we found no change in the behavioral uh, had a, a overall physical activity. So they, they, they kept burning, quote unquote, the same amount of calories per day, okay? So that's interesting to me, and it illustrates that those negative metabolic adaptations, and also the subconscious strategy your body will use to reduce how much fuel you're using, making you lazy, subconsciously decreasing how much you want to move. And sometimes you don't even notice. Like most people cannot really know the difference between taking 10,000 steps in a day and 5,000 steps in a day. Okay? Maybe they feel like I, I moved a little bit less, but it doesn't compute. Okay? Just by if you do a little bit less work around the house, you're walking a bit less, and that can account for 300 calories by itself. Okay? So, so it's stuff that oftentimes you, you don't notice. And that, that makes a big difference because it makes it much harder to keep losing fat as your diet go goes. But more importantly, to me, the take home message is that those metabolic adaptation and changes in behavior make it a lot more likely that once you stop your fat loss phase, you will regain the weight because now your metabolic weight is lower. So when you eat normally, you will store more, store more easily because it's gonna be easier to be in a surplus. And also the habit you took of moving less, it, it will probably stay with you, okay? But that's just again to illustrate that all, not all calorie deficits are the same. And I understand that not everybody can like train twice a day or, or walk 15,000 steps. But the point is that the more food you can keep in while still being in a deficit, enough to lose 0.5 to 1% of your body weight per week, uh, the more food you can keep in, the better off you'll be during the diet and afterwards. All right. That having been said, let's get your question or you notice that there's full plate in front of me so that's a good thing right first good morning coach uh, dante trudel has been arguing forever that massive adductors uh, equals massive leg size and that the seated adduction machine is a must do you agree uh, yes and no uh, a must no exercise is a must for example if you do a full range squat like very like i don't like to say ass to grass but a full range squat uh, or even a full range axe squat, the adductors will get a significant stimulus. I've always had pretty good adductors and I've never trained them. I wouldn't have adductors like a Mr. Olympia, but I don't have the overall size of a Mr. Olympia either, right? But uh, I believe that the full range squat and full range axe squats actually work the adductors. And, and I learned this when I actually pulled my adductor. Uh, when I did axe squats or even parallel squats, I was fine. As soon as I went below parallel, my adductor, like, it was really painful because it was being involved, right? So that's what you need. Now, I don't agree that it's mandatory, but then if, you, if your sport is bodybuilding and you want to exaggerate all your body parts to give that massive overall look, then you know what? It might be a good addition. It might be a good addition. Um, if you're just someone who wants to be lean, muscular, strong, it, there are probably better things you can invest your training time in, right? Uh, the other point is just that, okay? Massive adductors might be something very important for bodybuilding, but how important is it for other endeavors, like for real life? I mean, there's nothing, and from experience, okay? There's nothing worse than having that chaffing between your legs because the adductors are always in friction. 
I mean, I remember when I was uh, doing weightlifting, I, did weightlifting I, I had like 32 inches height, and most of it was doctor. Like, you know, my legs were like a chicken drumstick. Anyway, uh, so, uh, I, and I was playing golf at the time. I just could never finish an 18 hole because at the 12 hole mark, I would be like almost no skin between my legs because of the chassis. Uh, then again, I, then I discovered bike shorts, but still, it's not comfortable. Also, if you're an athlete and you have to sprint, if your adductors are too massive, it can change your sprint mechanics. You have to spread your leg apart when sprinting, or there's some friction there. So there's an argument. Whereas, well, if you're a bodybuilder, yeah, maybe you want that, but for most people, that's not something that is likely desirable. Have you got any tips for dealing with setback this year? One thing after the other, and it's my body, accident, injuries. Uh, that's a hard one because it, it's on, and I'm not taking the easy way out, but it's really what it is. It's an individual thing because, like, you speak of injuries, you speak of illness, you speak of accidents. Uh, some will cause more training limitation than others. Some will, so, so you, two people can have accidents or injuries. But, but they will impact their training in a different way. Um, so really, what, the only thing I can tell you is if you are having a skin of injuries and accident, your body is likely more likely to get injured again. It's probably better to stay the easier way to get back in shape. Anyway, the good thing is that if you lost muscle and strength, it is much easier and require much weaker stimulus to bring it back up. You don't need to be crazy right now. I would certainly spend more time uh, just gradually building your work capacity, gradually uh, building your muscle mass back up, gradually building your, uh, your, your, your strength back up, and probably including more uh, preventive work around those places that got injured or that sort of thing. And if I can do Coach, how many months since you started martial arts? Probably four months. Have you felt looser with your striking? Yeah, but I'm also doing boxing, which, which really helps. Uh, my, my striking, my kicks uh, are, are much better, especially on my right side. I'm still having some issue with my hip mobility on the left side. From years of, like when I was coaching football or coaching, I was always leaning on my right side. My right side always got more stretch on the left side. So I have more motor control on the right side. Uh, and more mobility. So I still have to work on that, especially my side kicks and on the roundhouse kicks. But for uh, like straight kicks, uh, that that fine. And my punching is fine. Uh, although in my last boxing session, I did hurt my wrist. Uh, I just didn't play properly and I had one bad punch and it just lingered. It seems fine now, but I did uh, my. Uh, Loaded carry my farmer's walk with a slightly tilted hand at night something. But it, it's still enough to be punching. But yeah, it has improved quite a bit. Thank you. I also feel my shoulders are much better overall. Uh, maybe because of I'm doing more range of motion work and also because the striking and absorption actually make the shoulder more resilient to the weight. All right. When reading a food label for raw meat, is there a way to tell how much fat will be of the meat when going to Yes and no. Okay, here's the thing with food label, okay? It can be, okay, again, and that depends on the type of food. Some, some foods have almost margin for error. Some are allowed as much as 20% difference between the label claims and what's actually in there. Right from the start, you don't know exactly how much fat there is in the meat your body. Okay? Because it, like, Cows are like people. I mean, they don't carry fat the same way. They don't have the same proportion of fat or whatnot. So some fat, some part of the uh, of the steak, even if it's the same cut, might have more fat than others, depending on the cow itself or fat distribution, stuff like that. There's an average that is pretty accurate, but it's not 100% accurate. And then there's probably, they can be as, as high as like 10% on up or down as far as the label thing. So right up to that, it's kind of hard to know how much fat there is in that meat to start with. And then you will lose some of the fat uh, when, when you cook it, when you grill it. Uh, it's around a third. Okay? Proper grilling will, uh, will lead to a decrease in fat content of the meat by around a third. Uh, again, but 
That will depend on how it's cooked. It will depend on many factors. Uh, so it can be, it can be a range, let's say, from, uh, let's say, one third to one fourth or something like that. So as you know, as you can see, there's no way to know exactly how much is up because you don't know exactly how much is in. You don't know exactly how much is lost. But one third is a pretty good average to uh, make your calculation on. I hate terrible for a week. A lot of dessert and bread separate from my normal beef and rice meal. When I look at the mirror, I look leaner. And lost fat in the midsection. How can that be? Uh, that can be two things. First, you, you, you might have lost fat. I mean, I, I've seen that happen uh, when a friend of mine was dieting for a bodybuilding competition, he was stuck at a certain body fat level. And only when we reintroduced more carbs in his diet did he, his body fat start moving. That can be first from an increase in metabolic rate from the increase in food. Now, I'll be the first one to say that a cheat meal or a feed or refeed day or cheat day is not enough to spring up your metabolic rate. Okay? Uh, but a whole week of eating a bit more or over eating more than maintenance, for example, or certainly more than you are eating, might have been enough to increase metabolic rate. A bit. There's also the fact that. Has a unique effect, so that might be one of uh, the reasons. Okay? Uh, also, because you were better fed, maybe for, as I mentioned earlier, you might have been more active without even noticing it. So, so that's a second thing that could be possible. Uh, and that can, could have offset the increase in calories without even knowing it. Second, it, it could be simply a visual thing. It could be that before you ate all of that, uh, you were flat. You were retaining more water. If you have, if you were in a caloric deficit state, or trying to lose fat, okay, or maybe not even voluntarily trying to lose fat, but still in let's say, a, a lower or caloric deficit state, what can happen is you can start to retain water inside the fat cell. Uh, that's because excessive caloric restriction or long-term caloric restriction will increase baseline cortisol level. Cortisol will increase the two hormones responsible for water retention. Testosterone was a person, so it puts you in that water retention mode. You're going to be retaining more water beneath the skin, but also in the fat cells. Because in the fat cells, fat is stored in the form of triglycerides. A tree molecule of, of three fatty acids attached to a skeleton, a pitchfork of glycerol. When you lose fat, what happens is the fatty acids get disconnected from the glycerol skeleton and exit the fat cell to be used for fuel. But the glycerol skeleton stay there. Now, glycerol attracts water. Okay, attracts, That's why it, it's often included in pre-workouts because it gives you that pump look because whether, wherever glycerol is, water follows. So if the glycerol becomes in the fat cells, it will attract water. If on top of that, you put yourself in water retention mode because of the high cortisol, the water can enter the fat cell. So you can actually look fatter than you really are. Okay? So if, for, for example, you reintroduce lots of carbs, carbs is literally the best supplement to decrease cortisol. Uh, so if you add more carbs, you probably lower cortisol, which could actually get you out of water retention mode, and you could have had that flushing effect, getting that water out of the fat cell, whoosh, getting leaner. Okay? I often see that with, with physical athletes, and we call it the whoosh effect. Uh, also, another thing that could have happened is maybe your muscles were flat uh, because you might have been somewhat glycogen depleted, making your muscles look smaller. So first, you look smaller, but also since the muscles are less like blown up, they, they are not pushing as much against the skin. So the skin looks looser. It makes you look fatter again. So if for a week, you have a lot more carbs, you replenish muscle glycogen, the muscles are filled up, so they are looking bigger, but they're also pushing more against the skin, creating the illusion of more leanness. What likely happened is probably you did not lose fat, you probably just revealed your true leanness by flushing some water retention and inflating your muscle for glycogen. Most bodybuilders after a competition will report looking much better for the week after a competition when they eat a lot more, but that look vanishes if they keep eating like that.
At what age do most people need to taper back on their training or be smart about their volume and intensity? Uh, never, never. Um, first, you should be smart about your volume and intensity right from the start, right? Um, just because you can get away with it when you're younger doesn't mean you should not make the efforts in improving that aspect. Uh, and I think that a lot of people believe that as they're getting older, they should not train as hard. Uh, and maybe they get more injured, but I think that a lot of the capacity to keep training hard as you're getting older comes from the fact that you believe you can train hard. So subconsciously, you, you stop pushing as hard as you did or training as much as you did, and that leads to a very, very, very slow and gradual detraining effect. Okay? It's, it's very progressive, but your work capacity slowly decreases. The adaptations that are no longer seen as needed regress. You're actually making your body weaker because you think it's weaker. Okay, uh, uh, this this great book that I read like 20 years ago called Younger Next Year uh, talked about that, and it, it gave a great example. And I'm, if you've been around people who work on farms or physical labor, you've seen that. I've seen that myself. Uh, um, an old man who works on his farm, very physical labor work, until he's like 70 years old, and he's in great shape. He's still strong, still going. The moment he retires, all the aches and pains start to come out. He has health issues when he dies within like two or three years or, has several, or, or like just goes down the drain. The physical activity is what actually holds them at this peak quote unquote condition. Now, it's unrealistic to think that your performance level will not decline as you're getting older because there's a point where like hormones, like uh, the uh, accumulated uh, stress on the tissues, it will eventually decrease performance capacity. That's why you don't have any 50-year-old world-class athletes. You have very high-level 50-year-olds, but they're not breaking actual world records being guys who are 25. So there, there's that. Uh, but I believe that uh, you should still apply the same principles. The one thing I will notice is that maybe you need more recovery time, so maybe more off days during your week. Uh, I think that you probably need to spend more time working on mobility. Uh, more stuff, uh, more work on conditioning, aerobic capacity, because these are lost pretty quickly, so you need to maintain them. Uh, but other than that, I mean, if you, everything is fine, age is not the main issue. The main issue is the if you did train like an idiot when you were younger or, or just trained super hard, you might have link you might have issues, you might have physical problems that were up not because you're getting older, but because of your whole old training career. That might warrant changes in training approach. But if you have uh, like a 50, 60 year old person who doesn't have those limitations, and, and you have overall, that then you know, hard and still progress. I remember um, a client, a former client of mine, who actually beat his uh, deadlift record at 63. He was still doing fire, fire fit competition, which kind of looks like CrossFit, but until he was seven years old. Uh, he was training harder than most people a third of his age, and that's putting it mildly. I remember that my goal was actually to try to kill him during the workout. I mean, I remember a few workouts, he spent the whole workout at a heart rate of 180, which should not be possible that age, but it was. Uh, I mean, I've tried all the kind of crazy shit to, to, to drive him down, but he always did it. He was in much better condition than anybody I've trained that were half his age. There's also the, the theory that, um, genetic theory that your mindset and your belief, your, your real belief, not just what you want to be in, but your real belief, your deep belief can affect uh, gene activation. So like believing that you can't train as hard might actually turn on genes that will accelerate uh, the, the, the loss, loss or the process in which you're losing capacity. What are your current favorite exercises? In 2014, you wrote high level for yoke, power snatch, for discipline, deadlift for mass. Why did I say that? I was stupid like that. A deadlift for, a dip for back, farmers walk, and aerobic health, uh, feel and press. Well, you know what? It, it, it's still pretty much the same. It's still, I still love snatch grip high pole. Uh, I still love the power snatch for athleticism. I don't like the deadlift for mass. I actually don't like the deadlift period. Uh, I still. Personally, prefer the dips for pack. Farmer's walk is one of my favorite. So, 
like of all the exercises that you mentioned, besides the deadlift, are all the corner are all the cornerstone of my program. I'm not doing uh, power snatches as much now. I was doing them two weeks ago. I started doing them because uh, uh, my pulling technique was not up to par, and uh, I was forced to do split snatches because uh, of lack of the rotation. I couldn't get the proper position overhead but until I fix that. As I'm just going to stick with. The pulls because as soon as my shoulder rotation is back, then I'm going to be doing the, the snatch. So besides the lift, all of these are all still my favorite exercise, at least for me. Hey, coach, good to see you. Been injured, but when I'm back, if plasma isn't available, well, it will be available. Uh, what do you recommend? Uh, my new MB on Eastern uh, Royal Estate, I was doing surgical calcul, but just not to go. Well, Matt can. It would be a better option uh, if it's still there. MAC-10 is essentially peptoprone steroids. I don't like to say that, but peptoprone is the full patient hydraulic state. MAC-10 is the diantripeptide version, which is more easily absorbed. Uh, and there's a very small amount of hydrogen cyclic dextrin, which makes its absorption even uh, easier. Uh, is hydraulic state in peptoprone is, is expensive, right? No, as I mentioned, the, the existing thing in plasma it's not casein hydrolysate, it's diantripeptides of hydrolysate, basically meaning that they took the, the casein hydrolysate molecule and split it into diantripeptides, so parts of two and three amino acids bound together to increase absorption. And there's also an argument to be made that it has slightly better uh, anabolic effect. But if, you're, if you really can't do anything else, I mean, if you, if you can't find plasma, then surge workout fuel plus MAC-10 would be my first choice. This is what I'm doing. Um, and if you don't have access to MAC-10 or it's too expensive for your budget, then yeah, Crypto Pro would be uh, the third option with, with the surge workout fuel, of course. I want to prep for the CrossFit Open in February. Uh, should I get ready now or six to 12 weeks before the CrossFit Open? Yes, it really depends on what kind of condition you're in and what are your skills like. Um, typically speaking, well, the way I approach CrossFit programming or approach when I work with other CrossFit athletes is much like a typical periodization for any athlete. So basically, it's divided into general physical preparation in uh, or off-season training, and it's in pre-competition and competitive state. Uh, state. And all these phases will have a slightly different training approach. And typically speaking, the, the first phase, which is a, a general physical preparation, the goal is to bring up everything that is not good enough to be competitive. So maybe it's working on your gymnastic skills. Maybe it's working on your Olympic training skills. Maybe it's working on your lactate tolerance. I don't know. Uh, but that this is where you are. The, the type of work you're doing is less trust meaning that the proportion of actual wads it is lower and the proportion of stuff you need to be good at is higher. And that can also include energy systems work, but they would be, it would be done with lower skill exercises, like a small bike, rowing your gummer, a spear, doing a carry, stuff like that, just to bring up your conditioning. Uh, you still want some wads in there because you don't want to lose the strategic capacity of performing well in a wad. Uh, but most of what you need to do in the WAD is done through the other training session. Basically, see, uh, with a CrossFit athlete, I see a WAD just like I would see a football game for a football player. So a football player in the offseason, they might have still some on field drills, but most of the work is spent training what they need to be good at football. And the closer we get to the season, we start doing more practice work. And then, obviously, during the season, it's mostly practice work. So, the second phase in a CrossFit Preparation, which would be the pre competitive phase, is where you start to put things together. Uh, you, first, you develop all the skills you need to be good at. Are they skills you have not mastered yet? Are they skills that need to be worked on? You do that first. But you enter the pre competitive stage with pretty much everything, at least at the level sufficient to be competitive okay? or to be able to do the actual was at the open. So at that point, the goal is to gradually integrate those skills into a CrossFit what type environment, okay? So I, I wouldn't throw all the skills in, in a what at the same time, but I would certainly include one skill movement per what 
to be able to do it in that fatigue state. Okay. And those words in the truth, and okay, I'll get back to that afterwards. That would be the goal here is to gradually integrate more what like work and introducing more skill into what so the ratio of cross specific work what is higher the ratio of strength power skill work is slightly lower it should be 50 50. and then the last phase which is the peaking phase where you actually prepare for the open which could last anywhere between six and twelve, which is a bit long if you've done your homework but certainly six to eight maybe 10 depending on what you need to work on that would be the, the specific phase so most of the work a good 75 percent is spent on various types of work uh, of what right? you keep the minimum amount of strength and skill work to don't have any to not have any degradation in those capacities but you invest a lot more work in actual crossfit work you want to be good at crossfit because being good at crossfit is not just mastering the skills it's not just having the proper energy systems available to you. It's also strategic. How do you approach each one? Where do you push? When do you rest? But the only way to be good at that is to do actual what. Okay. So that's so depending on where you stand, okay, you can start preparing six week out. We have basically all the skill mastered, you have already been doing what, so you know how to integrate process into what and you can just focus on crush it itself for six to eight weeks. If you have many skills you need to master, if you have uh, to start including what work, then you should start probably like three or four months out, maybe even more, depending on uh, how much work you need to do. Because each phase could last anywhere between six and eight weeks, depending on uh, how much work you need to do. Okay. Um, as for the wads, I mentioned that like just broad number, okay, broad numbers. And general physical preparation, it could be something like 75%. Uh, strength, skill, and other stuff like the stuff you need to improve. So it could be it, it could still be conditioning, but it would be conditioning on single apparatus or low skill movements. Uh, and when it would do, it would be twenty five percent watts. Okay, uh, in the pre competitive phase, it would be 50, 50, roughly not a training time, and then in the competitive state, it would be twenty five percent strength, skill, uh, uh, strength or skill, and it would be seventy five percent watts. Okay. Now, the type of words I also believe should vary. Uh, I believe that uh, when you start your prep, so let's say that the, the starting with the second phase, the pre-competitive phase, and up to the competitive phase, which should be between a total of three to four months, maybe even five months, depending on the length of both phases, uh, you would start with words that are shorter but much more intense. So you start with words lasting six to eight minutes. And, but that's like pedal to the metal. And the goal is as you progress through your prep period, you gradually increase the duration of those wads while trying to maintain the same intensity level. Okay. It's kind of like the way uh, modern sprinters train. Modern, let's say a 100 meter sprinter will not start a season practicing 100 meter sprints. He will start by practicing starts. He will start by practicing 30 meters. And he will eventually work up to 60 meters and eventually to 100. Okay. The goal is you first develop speed, then you develop the capacity to maintain that speed as much as possible. For what is the same thing. You first work on the capacity to go pedal to the metal, and you gradually work on making and being able to tolerate that level of effort for longer. All right. Hopefully that helps somewhat. It's a very complex topic because it's, it's very dependent on what level you're at. You said dips, you have no shoulder pain. Do you have pain with decline? No, I don't have pain with decline either. Uh, so it's, I, I believe, is that my uh, in the shoulder capsule, like there's a little um, place where the tendons goes through the nerves. And me, because of all the pressing I did, I think it, it has crumbled like that. And it and I do regular pressing or overhead, it compresses. It just closes up. When I do dips, it kind of opens up. That would be my theory. Or maybe I can, in dips, I'm using like a V bar handle like this, I can better keep an internal, uh, externally rotated shoulder position. That might be the reason. Oh, sorry. Oh, there's another question. <laughs> Hopefully I can get through all of that. So I might get into like blitz mode. Can someone like you in their 30s and 40s become more flexible if they work at it? Absolutely. Flexibility would be good for martial arts. It absolutely is. 
I've already improved it. I, uh, especially in my shoulder joint, it's better. Uh, in my uh, hips, it's, it's better. It's not perfect yet, but it, it literally light years ahead of what it was uh, a month ago or a month ago. It, it, it does take time. I, I personally like loaded stretching. I believe that it does give me the best length of my block and it leads to the fitness gains in mobility. Yeah, it, you can anything you can work on, you can improve. Why do pro crossfitters take carb powder or rice cake or candy after workout? They just want to replenish glycogen stores. Are they adding calories to their deficit for the total daily energy expenditure intake for the day? No, it's it's first. I don't believe that CrossFit athletes are shooting to be in a deficit because you can't really push them in a deficit. It's really a matter of the they expanded, they used up a lot of glucose or glycogen during the workout, and they want to replenish the glycogen stores as fast as possible. Studies have shown that uh, the period right after a workout, the glycogen within the system is a bit faster. Okay? And a lot of times, these pro crossfitters have two workouts a day. It's even, even more important to replenish also glycogen between two sessions. Yeah, I also have herbs after a workout. I don't have candy, but it, it's a relatively fast absorbed carbs because I want to replenish the glycogen I, I used up during the workout. There's also this argument that uh, including carbs with protein after workout increases the anabolic effect of the protein, which is debatable because some studies found that it doesn't, that it doesn't. But certainly uh, for CrossFit athletes and CrossFit, keep in mind that the energy system mostly used in CrossFit rely on carbohydrates for fuel. So you usually don't want to run a workout with depleted glycogen stores. Continuing on from your 25% deficit uh, diet that I mentioned earlier. So that's just to be clear for those who just joined. Uh, it's not my diet, it's a study that looked at 25% calorie restriction versus 12% restriction plus 12% increase in activity. Okay, so, uh, from your 25% reduction diet opinion, this diet for all weeks cut calories intake by uh, so basically what you're what, what you mean is you two weeks of super super low calories for only two weeks i heard this type hack and hack it's just eating less i mean i have bb bro who probably takes lots of steroids take clenbuterol which gives you amped up and maybe growth hormone that increases mobilization so his physiology is likely no, nowhere close to yours uh, but again two weeks of very again 25 percent is not super it's a it's a strong restriction but i just more it's like the same study looked at a, a super restrictive intake you looked at a diet of only 890 calories per day super low and that led to an even greater uh, decrease in uh, metabolic rate Increasing like almost 700 calories per day. Um, but for two weeks, there is likely not going to have any negative metabolic adaptations. Okay? So you can probably do that for two weeks without too much ill effect. It will probably affect your training, especially if you are carb depleted and your training requires most carbohydrates for fuel. Uh, but it, it will probably not have a long lasting effect. But I still question whether it's smart or not. I mean, the rate of loss between a 25% reduction versus a 12% is not going to be that great. Maybe like one or two pounds more over the course of two weeks. Uh, is that really worth it? Personally, I think not. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't call it a hack. But again, enhanced physiology, especially in response to dieting, is not the same thing as natural physiology. So do you wear jeans? No, I don't. <laughs> I really don't. My wife wished I did. <laughs> I, I'm not a sharp dresser. Uh, it, it's either like a hoodie and, and sweatpants, shorts, or like uh, cargo pants or army pants. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Uh, coach, what's better, eating food or just eating food like the size of carbs? And that depends on your goal. I mean, if you are. Uh, personally, uh, measuring is not necessary for me because I've been doing this for so long that I pretty much know how much I need to eat if I want X results. 
I believe that most people should probably start by measuring just to gain a better understanding of the food. But again, not everybody needs that. I don't know, most people really just need to have better overall eating strategies. You're just eating real food instead of processed food and just eating less desserts. Not everybody needs to be super drastic. Would an EAA, essential amino acids, be better than instant amino acids? I don't know what instant amino acid is. EAAs or BCAAs are essentially a big waste of money. I actually wrote an article about this on, on tibarmy.com called Subtraction by Addition, uh, in which I describe why BCAAs and EAAs are a waste of money, even though they are the most popular supplement around. Uh, it really does nothing. The most recent study has shown that either CAs when added after a workout does not increase protein synthesis, or muscle building more or recovery more, and just roll away protein. Okay? Um, now, one thing that does work is leucine. Leucine is one of the BCAs. It's also one of the EAs. You know, each amino acid does have individual benefits, individual functions. And leucine's one of its functions is to increase mTOR activation, which will increase protein synthesis. In that sense, leucine is a very anabolic amino acid. Okay, so, well, why isn't BCAs or EAs, which include leucine, not effective? Because subtraction by addition, the amino acid added to the leucine make the leucine less effective. BCAs have leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Leucine is the one that triggers anabolism. The other two, though, will compete with leucine for transport. If less leucine is transported, you don't get as much of an anabolic effect. Okay? Or if it just slows down its absorption and the level of blood leucine level is not increasing as fast, then you don't get the same anabolic effect. Same thing with EAA. So leucine itself, if added either to a meal or to a protein shake, will make that typically more anabolic. For an even better result, you would consume four or five grams of leucine by itself, then have a meal or a shake 15, 20 minutes later, so that you absorb the leucine without competition for transport, it increases anabolism, then you consume the food. I'm going through these questions faster than usual because there's a ton of them, which is a good sign, I guess. 60 to 85 kilos, struggling to put on weight and training for the past three years and a half. I do compound exercises along with weighted pull ups and dips for the past year, seeing some difference with this. Any advice? Well, if you have problems gaining weight, uh, it can very easily be uh, insufficient caloric intake. And most people I've seen who are struggling gain weight, you just don't eat enough for their individual requirement. I mean, your body type seems very similar to a, a former hockey player I trained. Uh, he was 62 and roughly 80, 85, yeah, 80, 85 kilos, just like me. And he needed, he needed to be bigger, but he couldn't. And he said, well, I, I eat a lot, Chris. I eat a lot. I'm always full. So he, I said, okay, write down everything you write. And, and his daily energy consumption came out be 2,500 calories per day, which was way too low for him to put any weight. But the thing is that oftentimes he would have like that one big meal and kept him full for a long time and he said, I'm full, I'm full, I'm full. But that led to a small, much smaller intake for all the other meals. So when we changed his diet so that he would consume close to 4,000 calories, I think it was 3,700, uh, he eventually worked his way up to 94 kilos without adding much fat, okay? So that's on the nutrition part. Uh, also, it's a matter of training. You mentioned the exercises you're doing. Are you, are you making gains in strength on those movements? I mean, not necessarily strength in the one hour range, but let's say you're using six reps, six reps per set. Are you getting stronger for those six reps? If yes, then it's probably nutrition. If it's no, well, you might not be training as hard as you need to train to gain size. I, I made a post on Instagram earlier this week saying that the Number one reason why people fail to progress in the gym is that they just don't train hard enough. And most people are not willing to accept that they're not training hard enough. Uh, but I've, I mean, I've been around hundreds of gyms in my life, you know, giving seminars, just training, whatever. And I, I haven't seen many people train what I would call hard. There's always a way to train a bit harder, okay? 
And that's one thing you need to look at. Exercise selection seems fine, although compound exercises uh, are not necessarily the best for size, depending on your leverage. Uh, but certainly, if you get strong at, stronger at them, you should see visual difference. If you're not, then look at your nutrition. Why are side to side kiss the ribs pull ups for love by wrestler and martial artists? How they transfer over? Uh, it, it's because when they're pulling, let's say you are grappling, very rarely are you pulling against the exact same resistance or lever. You will be out of position. The person will try to evade by twisting, so giving more resistance on one side or the other. So when you're shifting away, you are putting a lot more stress on the side you're shifting. And the kissing thing I don't get, certainly shifting right to left will, will mimic that attention. Pull and tug, uh, shifting the tension, pulling where you have an uneven resistance. So that, that's why it transfers. I heard boron increases saturation. I have a story. Uh, a... <laughs> Sorry about that. You take boron, no, I don't. Uh, or can you get from food or multivitamin? Uh, okay. That, that study. And, and I guess I, I remember okay, I was in high school, I think it was in college. I was 19 years old. And I was still, I was already passionate about training back then. And okay, just tell you that that boron thing is not new because that was a full. 26 years ago, 27 years ago, it was 27 years ago, and I just read in a muscle magazine that boron increased testosterone, and they quoted a study, dude, I need boron. So I went to my local supplement store, sell me all the boron you have. And it was those little uh, little bottle, it was like herbal mix, I don't, it, it tasted like crap. And I was, I was testing my bench press for football, and I took like three of them, and it, this is horrible. I make my record. Anyway, <laughs> it's increased testosterone. Uh, that study that showed increased testosterone from boron were on uh, postmenopausal women, like in their 60s, who were boron deficient. Okay, so adding boron to a healthy male person that is likely not boron deficient because they're eating a normal food intake likely will have zero impact. If you want a mineral that can increase testosterone, I will look at zinc and magnesium. Another CrossFit question. I perform CrossFit for six days a week in the early morning. Which one of your programs would complement my CrossFit? None of them. Do you, do you not compete? I do not compete. I just want to be in good shape and, and look good. Uh, okay, here's the thing. For this four to five CrossFit workouts a week, is a full workout. You cannot add another full workout to that unless you're a professional CrossFit athlete on steroids. That would be just way too much work. So what you can add is what your training in CrossFit is not providing you, okay? So likely you might not have as much or enough strength work on the big basic lift and maybe not enough hypertrophy work. So you need to add those two elements to your, to your program but in a way that doesn't increase the overall stress of your program too much or your week too much. Because you're already doing a lot of very, very physically demanding work, okay? And I commend you for wanting to improve. But, but the reality is that you cannot train everything at once. There's just no way to do a full-on CrossFit program than a full-on hypertrophy strength program. You can add component. For example, one thing that I, I found successful with CrossFit is using Here's a 531 uh, skeleton. Skeleton is only the main lift. So basically, you have one lift where you do bench, one lift where you do deadlift, one day you do squats, one day you do military press, and you use a 531 periodization scheme. Why do I like the 531 for CrossFit? Because it's very low volume, it's effective, and it's very uh, gentle progression. So it will allow you to get stronger, get your strength work in, without increasing overall stress so much that it will hurt your recovery from your CrossFit workout. So you can do that actually, just the, the one lift, the 521 will take you in like 10 minutes. But it can actually be done before your CrossFit workout or your CrossFit one uh, to start the workout. And then you could add one or two hypertrophy exercises for muscle you perceive as lagging for you, or add a gap workout at the end of the week. A gap workout would be more of a hypertrophy specific workout where you do, you do low stress exercises, 
your certain machine stable fully just for hypertrophy for the muscles that you feel need more work either because you want them bigger or because they are lagging and hurting your performance in crossfit so let's say you're training crossfit four days a week before each workout you do one of the four basic lifts using uh, the five to one schedule maybe add one or two hypertrophy exercise at the end of your one or more intelligently at a gap workout at the end of the week where you do your hypertrophy lift. but now you I, i'd like to study your program uh, but there's just no way you can recover from a full program and a full cross program together. Coach, what's your definition of training hard? I actually posted uh, about that yesterday on, on Instagram. I actually give my definition of training hard. I will just go to Instagram right now and read it to you uh, because I have poor memory. And anyway, it's just make sure it won't take long. Give me a second. A second. Just one second. Loading. All right. Training hard. What is training hard? That's the actual post. Uh, it, first, it, it's pushing yourself until you are uncomfortable. Again, and, and uncomfortable doesn't mean in pain. Like going to muscle failure is uncomfortable. Uh, getting, getting under a heavy squat is uncomfortable. Like a, a heavy weight that you are some anxiety before starting this, that's uncomfortable. Doing a hard conditioning session, and feel like if you feel like you're on fire and drowning at the same time, that's uncomfortable. That's what I mean. Okay. So if you never are uncomfortable in your training, you're probably not pushing yourself hard. Uh, training with the visceral need to do better than last time. Like everybody wants to improve, but do you have a driving need that if I don't do better this time, I suck as a human being and my world will crumble? That's kind of what you need. Uh, you can't improve at every single session, but you should have the burning desire to do better. Add more weight, do more reps, perform better, be more focused. You need to do better the last time. Also, to quote Mike Tyson, training hard is doing what you hate as if you love it. Okay? When you really love something, you have that extra edge, that extra edge, that extra effort. Well, you need to have that even on stuff you absolutely hate doing. And also, my personal favorite, when you train, to train. I see many people who are thinking about their weekend, talking to their gym crush, um, or doing, uh, going on their phone, uh, shitting shit with their, with their friends. That's not training. Training, you stay in the zone. During your rest, you, you think about what you did and what you can do better on your next set. That's what I think is training hard. Long limb. I have long limbs. Um, train five days a week. Cut it down to two or three days a week. Gradually get it stronger, but I need to up the weight on scale. I mentioned that's literally nutrition. All right, guys, we're up with the hour. I really had fun with your questions. Very varied. Took me out of my comfort zone. I really appreciate my experience. I hope you did too. So if you appreciated it, come back next week. Bring some friends. We have even better questions so that we have who answer and cool story. So same week, same, uh, 